Let's talk about calorimetry. Calorimetry, what does that kind of sound like? Calorie, and there's two different types of calories. So the normal science calorie we use right here with a lowercase c. The capital C is the one you see on the back of your nutrition labels. We call this a nutritional calorie. It is technically equal to a thousand of the normal calorie. So it's the same thing as a kilocalorie. So if you eat a Snickers and you eat that Snickers and it says that you just consumed 180 of these calories, how many of these calories did you really just consume? 180,000. So just think about that the next time you feel like a Snickers, right? It's 180,000 calories. Good times. Um, calorimetry. So we're studying processes involving like heat exchange and things of this sort. So how do they figure out that there's 180 calories inside your Snickers? 180 calories worth of energy. How do they figure that out? They light it on fire and put it in what's called a bomb calorimeter and see how much heat's given off while it burns. And that's how they measure the calories. Does that seem to make any sense about? Could be a little less, it could be a little more in actual. No, no, they get a pretty good number about it. Oh, okay. So does that seem like a good way to figure out how many calories end up inside your body when you eat a Snickers? Does it feel like a little, little fire in your tummy going on? <laughs> but it is the same chemical reaction. It's combustion. Notice, when you burn that Snickers, what are you reacting it with? O2. So, and what's being produced? Because it's a bunch of hydrocarbons, mostly CO2 and water. What do you need to stay alive? Well, that's what you get rid of, but what do you need to stay alive? Take in O2. And you're getting rid of CO2 and water. In the end, when you eat that Snickers, you don't actually light it on fire. You have a whole series of enzymatic reactions happening over a bunch of steps. But you start in the same initial state, Snickers and O2, you end up in the same final state, CO2 and water. And delta H is a state function, so it doesn't matter. It doesn't care what pathway you take, whether you light it on fire or whether you enzymatically do it over a bunch of steps inside your body. If it's the same net result, the delta H value is the same. It's a state function, path independent. So that's why they can just burn it and get the correct value. Cool. So these lovely bomb calorimeters typically have a certain heat capacity associated with them, which we use a capital C to measure. So in these bomb calorimeters, there's these highly insulated containers, and as they absorb heat, their temperature goes up slowly. And so we know that they can absorb so much heat per temperature change. So in this case, I put a question on your hand out there. It says, if an object absorbs 1,000 joules of heat, that's Q, and its temperature increases five degrees, that's delta T, what is its heat capacity? So we're actually trying to solve for C here. If I rearrange this, what is C equal to? C equal to? Yep. Oh, Q over C. Change. Good, Q over delta T. Anytime I ever see a delta anything, what does that actually mean? Change. Change in something and then final minus initial. Cool, in this case, how much heat do we plug in? And how big was the temperature change? Five. Five degrees. I don't really care if that's a Celsius or Kelvin temperature change, right? So notice, if I have 10 Kelvin, what is that in Celsius? Well, it's 273 degrees. Oh, minus 273 degrees. So it would be negative 263 Kelvin, right? So here's the deal, though. If I go up 5 degrees on the Kelvin scale, how much have I gone up on the Celsius scale? No, 5 degrees as well. So if I'm dealing with the temperature change, notice if I go from 0 to 5 Celsius, that would be the same as going from 273 to 278 Kelvin. In both cases, the change is exactly the same. The big mistake a lot of students make is if I put this in Celsius, they're like, oh, I've got to put this in Kelvin and I'll add 273. No, no, no. If we're talking about a delta T, 5 is 5 on either scale. It's T that is different on the two scales. But delta T, the change, 5 is 5 on the Celsius or Kelvin scale. So that's why I didn't put a unit on this one. Whether I said Celsius or Kelvin, it didn't matter. So in this case, what is 1,000 divided by 5? Let's just say that was in Celsius for a second. So the heat capacity of this calorimeter, whatever it was, this object, is 200 joules per degree Celsius. What this means, that it takes 200 joules to change it one degree Celsius. So if I gave it 400 joules, it would change two degrees Celsius. If I've given it 1,000 joules, it would change five degrees Celsius. 
I just have some giant container, in this case, maybe a bomb calorimeter or some giant object, and as I give it heat, I know that every 200 joules of heat I give it goes up a degree. That's what a heat capacity tells us. Now, more commonly in this chapter than that, you guys are going to be dealing with what we call specific heats or specific heat capacities. Yeah, you don't get to memorize those typically. I might have one exception. I'll tell you which one that is in a sec. But uh, specific heats, these are not the heat capacity of a giant container or of a giant object or something like that. It is the heat capacity of one gram of a substance. So, so specifically in this case, it is the amount of heat to change one gram of substance, one degree, either Celsius or Kelvin, take your pick. So that's what a heat capacity is. In the middle of the summer, if I put an aluminum park bench out in the middle of my backyard and right next to it, I have a kitty swimming pool and I fill it full of water that's exactly the same mass as the aluminum park bench. After an hour in the middle of the summer on a hot day, not like today, today was pretty gorgeous. So which one do I not want to sit on or sit in? Aluminum the aluminum bench. What if I happen to like burns on the back of my legs? Well, then that's the one I do want to sit in, right? No. <laughs> So I definitely don't want to sit on the aluminum bench. Why not? So if you notice, being out in the sun, they were both out in the same sun on the same day for the same time. Is there any difference as to which one got more heat from the sun? No, same Q. And it was this, I told you the park bench and the amount of water in the kiddie pool, same mass as well. So the only things different are these two values. Which one gets hotter? The aluminum bench, it has a much larger temperature change. If these two are equal, for delta T to be larger, what has to be true about the specific heat of the aluminum? It has to be smaller, actually. That way, if these two are the same, you got the same equation in both cases. If delta T is higher for one, its specific heat has to be lower. So, and notice a lower specific heat means it takes less heat to raise its temperature. So if you give two objects the same amount of heat, whichever one takes less heat to change temperature is gonna go up more. So a lower specific heat means it actually, its temperature will change faster as you add or remove heat or I shouldn't say faster, I should say more as you add or remove heat. A higher specific heat means that it takes more heat to change its temperature. So this is why, you know, like if you live near the beach, that's a great thing during the day. It keeps the temperatures cooler because water can hold a lot of heat. It's got a very high heat capacity. And so if water is absorbing all that heat, that means there's less going to you as you sit on the beach. So, but it's also great at night because nights tend to get cold, but guess what happens to all that heat the water's been getting all day long? starts letting it go at night and so it stays a little bit warmer at night near the beach so kind of whole idea of the maritime climate here uh if we look here there are a couple times when this equation is worthless to you and that is any phase change so if i take ice what temperature does ice melt at um, fahrenheit but 32 fahrenheit zero. definitely want it on the celsius scale zero degrees celsius what temperature does it boil on the celsius scale 100 degrees. Definitely you want to memorize those, by the way. That's actually how Mr. Celsius or centigrade came up with his scale. He said, that's where water freezes. I'm going to call that zero. That's where water boils. I'm calling that 100. And he broke it up into 100 degrees in between. So in this case, you should definitely know those two points. But when you go through a phase change, you have to add more heat, add more heat. And it turns out to pull the molecules apart and break some of their interactions, that actually takes heat. And so when you get to a phase change, that heat doesn't actually change the temperature at all. It just breaks some of those interactions. So if I'm heating up ice, I have really cold ice. As I add heat, the temperature goes up, temperature goes up, temperature goes up. But when it hits zero, I add more heat and the temperature doesn't change. And I add more heat and the temperature doesn't change. But it's melting it at that point. The heat is actually take, you know, carrying out the phase change. And not until it's all melted that as I add more heat, will the temperature start to change again and go up higher than zero. So when you're going through a phase change, no temperature change whatsoever. And if there's no temperature change, then this equation is worthless. So if we kind of look at this, I put a diagram on your hand out there, kind of looking at temperature versus the heat added. Kind of looks like this. If we do this specifically for water, this would be your melting point. This guy would be your boiling point when it flattens out, when your T value, your temperature is not changing there, not changing there. That's when you're going through a phase change. So as long as you're not going through a phase change, 
MC delta T is your friend. So as long as your temperature is changing, this is when this equation allows you to calculate heat changes. But that equation doesn't help you calculate the heat change involved uh, in a phase change at all. For those, you need a, a f delta H of the phase change. What do we call melting again? Uh, melting is fusion. fusion. So you need a delta H of fusion. And then for this guy, you'll need a delta H of vaporization in order to actually calculate how much heat it takes to melt or boil something. Cool? So if you look on your handout, I've provided you with some lovely values. In fact, I put them on your page twice and I didn't mean to. I meant to delete them off of one. But anyways, how much heat would be required to take 90 grams of ice at, what, negative 20 degrees Celsius and heat it up to 30 degrees Celsius? So if you notice, if I look at this graph, where is negative 20 degrees Celsius? Right about there. Okay, and where's 30 degrees Celsius? Right about there. To get from negative 20 to 30, am I gonna go through a phase change? Yeah, well that sucks. So had I not gone through a phase change, this would be a simple calculation. So, but turns out I'm gonna use MC delta T to calculate the amount of heat it takes to heat this up from negative 20 up to zero. Then I'm going to have to use the delta H of fusion to figure out how much heat it takes to melt it. Then I'm going to have to use MC delta T again to figure out how much heat it takes to heat it from zero up to 30. And the key is this, ice and liquid water and gas, you know, steam for that matter, they all have different specific heat capacities. So, and that's why you got to do a different calculation here than you do here, because the CS value is different. Cool? So in this case, I gave you those values on your handout. We're going to involve three calculations here. And again, part one, Q equals MC delta T. Part two is going to involve the delta H of fusion. And part three, again, is going to be Q equals MC delta T. So in this case, if we do part one, which I'll call this step right here, two here, three here. For part one, what's my mass of water? Or mass of ice in this case? 90 grams. What's my specific heat capacity of ice according to the text box? 2.03 joules per gram degree Celsius or Kelvin, same diff. And then what's my temperature change? Uh, 20. Positive 20 or negative 20? Positive. positive. Yeah, and we're going, well, it's not the absolute value. There's a positive and a negative. Because uh, we're going up in temperature, it's positive. If we were going down, it'd be negative. And again, it's always final minus initial. So final, zero, minus initial, negative 20, zero minus 20, or zero minus a negative 20 is 20. But it's not an absolute value, totally matters. Cool, and we'll do the same thing. Let's just do step three right off the bat again because we got the same kind of calculation. So for step three, what's my mass? It's liquid water now, still 90 grams. What's my specific heat? Good, 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. And what's my temperature change? Yep, going from zero up to 30, so positive 30 here. Cool. And I'm going to make you do some plugging and chugging here in a second. Now for step two, this is going to be a little more of a pain in the butt. The delta H of fusion, what is it given to you as on your handout? Uh, 6.01. 6.01 what? What is it given? Good, I was going to say, I did it wrong if it's not, but it's kilojoules per mole. And here's the deal. It can be kilojoules or joules per mole, but it can also be kilojoules or joules per gram. And so here's the deal. If this is what it is per mole, what if you have two moles of water? Then how much, what would delta H be? 12.02. 12 12.02, you got to double it. It's a what kind of property? Because it matters, sample size matters. It's an extensive property. How much you have matters. This is what it is per mole. If you have two moles, double it. If you have three moles, triple it. If you have 10 moles, multiply by 10. You gotta multiply by the number of moles. But if I give it to you in kilojoules per gram, you don't need to multiply by the number of moles. You need to multiply by the number of 
grams instead. So be careful on your units. I can't just say multiply by moles or multiply by grams because I don't know what units you're going to get it in. So be careful. Be prepared to see it either way. In this case, we're going to have to multiply by moles. Do I know how many moles of water I have? I got to figure it out. I got 90 grams. Let's go back here. 90 grams of water. What's the molar mass for water? Which I'm going to round to 16. Okay. Um, so it's 18, 18 Good. 18 grams per one mole. And so if I got 90 grams, how many moles is that? Good. Perfect time for a calculator. It's exactly five. I chose a nice round number to make this easier on me. So we've got five moles of water, and we need to multiply that by the 6.01 kilojoules per mole to find out how much that is. So now we've got three different calculations for Q, and we're going to add them all together. We have to make sure their units match, though, because these are both going to come out in. Definitely not Celsius. Definitely not grams. <laughs> What's left? We're going to get joules. But for this one, what are we going to end up with? That one you're going to end up with uh, kilojoules. Kilo so I've got to make sure their units match before we add them. So can you give me some math here? Yeah. So I can approximate it, but I can't get an exact answer faster than you can with your calculator. 3,654. And then the next one's going to be 30.05, and then that one's going to be... Seven thousand what? Five hundred twenty-four. Cool. Should I convert these all to joules or all to kilojoules? Uh, just, or I like joules. You like joules? I like kilojoules. You don't want either one. <laughs> what kind of test are you taking again? A chemistry test. It's a chemistry test, yes. But what's the format? Oh, uh, probably kilojoules. What? No, no. It's multiple choice. Look at your answer choices. See what units they use. And if they use only joules, then let's do joules. If they use only kilojoules, then we'll use only kilojoules. If you use a mix of both, well, then you're probably going to have to figure it out in both and figure out what's the right answer. So let's just do this in kilojoules, because I think that would be likely. So in this case, to turn joules into kilojoules, I've got to divide by 1,000. So this is 3.654 kilojoules, and this is 7.524 kilojoules. And if we add all three of these together in kilojoules, what do we get? I did. That's what messed me up. I was trying to do it in my head. <laughs> Wait a second. Cool. 41.228 kilojoules. Life is good. Notice the more phase changes you go through, the more calculations you get.